first of all, I'm not Larry Goldberg and I'm not Thomas Rulovich, and I'm not a, a vendor of a, a software, and uh, I'm also not a techie. So let's see what happens. Uh, I, I, I'm glad to be here, and I just have to do the first test here, which is switching to number three. So you can see, topic today is the decision model. So um, when I saw the beautiful landscape, I got a little more relaxed. And then when I listened to uh, Paul in the keynote, I got even more relaxed because what really caught my attention was uh, when he said that in the past, AI, <coughs> expert systems, and also uh, business rules really didn't catch on because there was a big problem with the maintenance that caught my uh, in, uh, attention. I thought, oh, this is interesting. So, and then when he went on and uh, explained that whatever we can automate, we will automate, I thought, hmm, maybe I should be here, right? And then uh, when he went on and talked uh, about how to link business and IT is becoming one of the key focal points what we are doing in the BPM space, I really felt at home. So with that, don't worry. Uh, I think we have something to offer. And uh, I'm coming from sales, so for me, obviously, the customer is in the center, and I would like to start my presentation with a real-world example to show you what decision modeling is all about, okay? So that's just the lead-in. Um, it's a blog that uh, uh, Rob Lux from uh, Freddie Mac just recently published. It was March 4th. Uh, fourth of this year, and uh, just a few things to get the feel for it. He said, it only took Freddie Mac 17 business days to write, test, and deploy the 100 plus rule changes comprising our Hurricane Sandy disaster relief policies for the systems lenders used to sell and service Freddie Mac mortgages. That is about 90% less time than it took to operationalize policy changes follow disasters like Hurricane Katrina, or the 22 New England floods. And then he goes on and on, uh, and I, I will not go into all details, but he said, altogether, within seven weeks of the storm, Freddie Mac was able to fund nearly 14,000 loans, providing direct and measurable relief to families impacted by the disaster. That makes me feel good because that's a practical impact that you can have by decision modeling. And I show you how that worked, right? So if you look at the typical process that they have to react to a disaster like Sandy, uh, they have a threat assessment when the storm is predicted. Uh, they look at the crisis team, form it, and they draft plans uh, and finalize those uh, plans when the storm strikes. They have a damage assessment when uh, the, the storm is uh, over, and then they draft policies. So all of this takes time, right? So uh, this marks the starting point in the conventional process, where they then pass policies uh, that are documented in English narrative to, uh, to their BAs. And the BAs then take it again and write uh, the requirements also in narrative, and then pass that on to IT that then have to make the interpretation. So in the case uh, of uh, Sandy, they were able to still document the uh, policies, but then use uh, what we call human machine readable model that also was able to test the logic before it actually was passed to IT. And in fact, they were able to use an API that populated their rules engine, their execution system. So with that, you could compress the 26 uh, weeks that it typically took to just three weeks, and it was 70 days, what he said, right? So that's where we are today. Tomorrow, or in the future, they want to further compress this whole process because obviously there is a still a, a significant amount of in in inefficiency in the fact that you have to document the policies and then re-enter that in the human machine readable concept. So what they want in the future is to directly author the policies in a way that is machine readable and that further compressing this three weeks 
to one day. When I heard that the first time, I thought, well, I cannot tell about it because it's, it's hard, hardly to believe, right? But uh, I felt a little better when uh, Patrick had uh, his presentation at, uh, from, by SAP, where you are also able to accomplish a tremendous amount of uh, reduced speed, reduced effort. So I think this is something what we will see more and more, and there is a, is a new world coming at us. So <clears throat> since I'm at the BPM conference, I thought I'd give you a, a quick background what we understand under the decision model. I understand this is a, is a, is a, is a more a technical uh, presentation, but uh, I, I want to give you this background. So what is the decision model? Um, first of all, it's a book. It's a model, it's a methodology, and we have a growing number of technology software vendors that are using the decision model to uh, provide value to, to clients. Now, where, where do you find the decision model? In the areas of requirements um, to help uh, companies to capture the data quality lo logic and also uh, at, uh, capturing business logic typically as a part of uh, business transformation projects. Now, if you look at this graph or this picture here, you see this is the typical flow. You have a subject matter expert, and then there are business analysts that are capturing uh, the requirements from those subject matter expert or experts, and then they pass this information to the people that uh, do the coding or the adjustment uh, in, in, the, in the COTS products. Now, with a show of hand, how many from you believe if you send two different BAs to the same subject matter expert will come back with the same English narrative describing the, 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 the requirements. Don't be shy. It's just recorded. So who, who believes they have the same? Who believes they don't? So let's start with the same. How many people, uh, how many of you think these two BAs will have the same narrative that they pass to the people in, in, in IT? Nobody? Just control question? So you all believe that they won't? I don't hear you. OK, OK. So that's in, in correlation with what we find typically if you, if you go out, out in the field, right? We never had this, uh, the situation that they all said, yeah, we are 100% uh, uh, convinced about it. That's a fundamental problem. If, if you look at our whole economy, uh, all our software development is based on the artistic interpretation of highly qualified uh, poets, writers, authors, considered to be business analysts, right? Um, we, we, we think there's something, we should do something better. We are, we are now, in the future, you know, we are, we are past Jetsons and we are still depending on, on, this, uh, on this narrative. So I will tell you how, how we, we partially solve this. A uh, quick timeline so that you know where we're coming from. Um, a lot of you may know Barbara von Halle. She is the co-author of uh, the Handbook of Relational Data-Based uh, Design. She worked with Ted Cott when the relational model was conceived and became more and more popular. She had a lot of experience in seeing this new technology, this new idea taking ground. And then uh, she ventured into the business rule space. And I think that's a, that's a, it is a point also where, where Paul said, well, they did something, and it was not so bad, but it really was not that hot after all. So Barbara met Larry, and both came to the conclusion there should be something better to, to, to manage, to uh, capture, to organize uh, business rules, right? And they, they went out, they worked with a couple of companies, and developed together with them under NDA the decision model. And it's a model of business logic. Now, we started very primitively with uh, Excel and, uh, and Visio, and, uh, and, and people were very excited about it. But very soon, they discovered you cannot run a multi-billion company on Excel and, and Visio in terms of capturing business logic, right? So this was the point where we figured out we need a very robust enterprise-grade application that serves as a repository of all of this uh, business logic, but also 
as a very strong governance, because this is the next thing. You just don't want to have everybody over the place doing whatever they want, right? So uh, luckily, um, we found Sapiens, and Sapiens found us. Uh, they are our technology partner, and uh, here in the group is uh, Jim Gallen. He is, uh, he is my partner uh, on, the, on, on the technology side. Uh, we, f we found each other, and uh, Sapiens dedicated a whole department just developing decision. Uh, decision is a very powerful uh, uh, business decision management tool, and I will attempt to do the crash test uh, NESCOF piece if I have enough time. How much time do I still have? Yeah, I'm good. So um, <clears throat> after that, uh, we, we got more and more proliferation in the field, and uh, now OMG is starting to uh, work on an initiative to have also a standard for decision modeling notation. I see that there will be some parallels to the BPMN uh, in, in a way. Um, obviously, there is a need out there. And if I look at some of your slides, uh, Paul, I saw the decision management uh, uh, just appearing in the middle or at the end when we go into the future. So I feel very, very good about that. And we see that there's a lot of adoption coming. Now, one step back, and since we are all very old here, including myself, so I think uh, having some uh, great attributes uh, qualifies it to be here, uh, I just want to go back and uh, in time uh, to the big ball of mud, right? That's a, it's a, it's an entry point that should just illustrate where we're coming from. Uh, in the past, uh, and I think all of you, you're, you're familiar with the big ball of mud, uh, in the past, everything was in the code until uh, the separation of concerns became prevalent and we were able, out of a sudden, to separate databases, to separate reporting, and now re maintenance was so much easier and we were able to invent the internet and uh, uh, and we are really good track, right? The only thing from our perspective that's currently missing is a separation of business logic. Because if you look today, business logic is in the graphic user interface. Business logic is in the heads of the people that know uh, how to deal with a certain process. Business logic is also in the data. So it's everywhere and nowhere, right? So we think being able to separate also business logic will enhance the, the, the ability to maintain those systems and will have a tremendous impact also on BPM systems, but also on business rules engines, right? Another example, and you have seen that many times, that's I think the, the typical entry scenario when one of you are entering a client that haven't been uh, uh, exposed to uh, BPM on, on, on a big scale. What it shows is a process that includes a lot of references to business rules, right? It's very convoluted, it's very hard to maintain, it's very hard to grasp what, what this is all about. Now, when we come in, we separate all the sequential data, everything that has a, a relevance to sequence, from everything that is declarative of nature. So there is a, is, a, is, a, is a separation to keep those two things separate, just also having the ability to maintain them much easier, much better. So what you see, this, uh, this octagons here, they indicate um, uh, anchor points for decisions. And uh, what we do with these anchor points, we reference them to our graphic notation. Now, from a technical perspective, the graphical notation for a business uh, a decision is not something really spectacular. However, the impact is tremendous because now business has a tool to easily communicate their complexity and the structure of all their decisions. Now, and I will explain you how that, uh, that, that works. But the key thing is you want to get away from the interpretation of English narrative to a very easy and understandable graphic notation. I think you're doing that already in the BPM uh, space. You would not write down how the process is actually, you know, in English. You have your notation, you have your graphics, and it's very easy to exchange and to talk about it. Now, the cool thing about the notation is now that we are able to capture all the inferential relationships until we come to a point 
that is what we call atomic business logic. So we break down the logic into different levels until we reach the point that we are hitting persistent data or data that we can access where we don't have any further interpretation to be made, right? Notation is very simple. Um, we will show you that. That's an example, a real uh, example. It's a determined policy renewal method. So you go to the client and say, okay, what's, wh what's relevant for doing this, right? And they will say, well, it has something to do with pricing, and it has something to do uh, with the underwriting uh, uh, policy and risk, and then um, there might be a, a case that we just override it manually, right? Very easy, very simple. Okay, you say, that's my decision, determine policy renewal method. And then you have two supporting rule families that go in, and that, uh, that's the policy pricing with inbounds and the underwriting risk. And then you see a dotted line. So the dotted line means that I'm at the level of persistent data. I, I, I don't have to go any further because I have this as a decision by a person, or I have that by a database, or I have that as, a, as an element that I can retrieve very easily, right? Now, the, uh, the errors here that end with this uh, uh, circle, they go into um, the next uh, the, the supporting rule families, and they show uh, what, what is important to determine the policy pricing within bounds. And again, you have a policy discount and a policy tier. So I think you get the concept, right? So you have a way to visualize what is my inferential relationship between all these elements, and I'm able to reach a point where I know I'm done, because this is a goal-driven, top-down top approach, right? It's not a bottom-up. Bottom-up, you never know when you're done, right? A goal-driven approach means you would only model decisions that are worthwhile to manage. You would not go with everything. So you really are selectively and focus on what makes the biggest sense, right? And then we have it linked to a tabular structure. And in a tabular structure, we omit all levels of if, then, otherwise, and else, because we want to have this atomic logic statement, right? The ors, we're handling with adding different rows to it. So we come to a point that the natural output of the decision model is the optimal input for all the subsequent execution systems, including Java, Code, or Drools, iLog, Blaze, or uh, any other execution engine out, out in the market. Now you're at the point that you have successfully translated the world and the language of business into a, at the level that IT actually can understand. Because if they have to read through 50 pages, they are not happy either, right? So and they want to focus on, on other things than, than, than this. Now, there's an important other aspect to that, and that is the structural declarative and integrity principles. And uh, they are uh, essential to uh, assure the rigor. So we all know that decision tables are out since uh, Jan van Tienen was a young man, right? So, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we all know that they are prevalent, but it is important to have this rigor and to, have, to assure that everyone that works on the rule family table knows exactly how they are governed, right? The other part that is really important is the, uh, the relationship uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the graphical notation, right? Now, uh, Normalization plays a big role in order to get uh, agility and, uh, and, and, and flexibility. Um, that's something that also Barbara brought as experience from her previous, uh, uh, from a previous, uh, yeah, from her previous life, right? Uh, with uh, working with uh, DB2, uh, working with Ted Cod. Now, for you, it's really important. We cannot live without BPM. Uh, BPM. We live in a BPM, and we are part of it, so, but we need a decision, what we call a decision-aware process. This is the home for our decisions. Now, before I go into the technology, um, just one thing. Can, can you read that, is that, or is that too small? There's just one example, and it, it says the two options, right? The first option says, um, ascertain person's employment history 
and if this is good, then uh, a, a certain uh, person stepped and then set credit rating to A, right? And option two, a, cert, uh, a certain person stepped. If that's low, then you go and check his employment history, and then you set it to A. W what's the difference? Anybody? Don't let me hang in here. The sequence. It's only sequence. So, and this is where we come in. So if it's sequence, right, uh, or if sequence does not matter, in this case, it's sequence, but the sequence does not matter. If it doesn't matter, you should not have it into, in your process. That's our, that's our opinion, right? So what we would do with the decision model is, we, we would eliminate this and just reduce it to determine person's credit rating, have a link to our decision model, and then have a, have a rule family table to, to structure that. The beauty about that is, as you can imagine, if you have other conditions that come on top of that, you just add on to the table, but don't have to expand your, 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 your process model. So that's, that's the part where we come in and where we have a, we have a big impact on how to deal with BPM, but we have no impact on the technology of, of, of BPM. So we are definitely a neutral there, right? So uh, decision model connects a number of different uh, 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 mo other models. Uh, we are not replacing anything, we are augmenting, right? So what I would like to do now, because the time is moving quickly, to go into the technology, uh, as I said, uh, Sapiens is our, is our partner. Uh, we have uh, just a quick overview where, where, where Sapiens would live. There is a design stack and there's an execution stack. Uh, you have the processes on one side, the decision and the data. Uh, Sapiens would uh, be linked to uh, the design stack here because we need to have the anchor points. And then author business logic into execution engines. And the beautiful, beautiful thing about that is it doesn't matter what kind of execution systems you have out there. So uh, you have a true independence in terms of what you're, what you're choosing, but you have one repository that shows you where you are. Um, then you have, of course, the data, data layer, but I, I have to prove that I'm technical worse now too, so I have to go. Decision, that's, uh, that's the application, it's not just a, it's a fantasy, uh, this is a real, uh, real application. Um, I cannot go through a whole demo, but I just wanna show you some highlights that, that might be of interest. So we have different communities. Uh, we have the possibility to uh, show the, uh, the, graphic, the graphic representation that would be a decision model similar to what we have uh, showed, you, uh, showed you earlier. Uh, we have the tabular structure here. Right. Similar to what I explained you for, uh, first, the, uh, the screen resolution, I just have the native here, so it's a little tight here. But uh, I think you can get the idea uh, the cool thing here is that if you look at uh, the additional info, it, it's very smart. It shows you uh, how many versions you have, um, where is this rule family view associated with, right? Uh, how many fact types you have, um, what is impacted, right? And, um, and that gives you a, a, a first glance about the complexity of projects, right? So um, now what I want to do next is I would like to start a new uh, uh, business uh, uh, change request. So go in there and type in BPM next to next to server. Select the community. BSC type, okay. Okay, excellent. So, 
Now I can add any kind of attachments that they are out. I just go out and uh, put an attachment in there, right? Now I save this. Open that. And uh, now in this case, I would have um, a policy, right? A policy that is in uh, English text. And I just copy that into the system. And now I have a, a very powerful glossary in, in the application, very powerful glossary. So I want to see what kind of terms are in there that, that I have already. So find synonyms. Oh, OK. So I see, OK, in this text, I have a number of, uh, of fact types already. OK. Now, it could be that I say, man, there is something, the flood zoning. So what are the flood zoning here? And I know I have something in there that is similar to that. Sorry, H. Okay. Oh, hurricane zoning change. Okay. I want to I, I want to add that as a as a synonym, right? So I, I have a possibility to do that. Then connect as a synonym. And I want to see, okay, I have a, a couple of uh, of effect types here, how they are um, how they are used into other areas, right? So I run, I run this query and give it a different name. Save run. Oh, so you see, I'm able to to observe where those those rule family fact types are used w throughout the system. So it's very slick. Uh, it helps people to keep an overview about uh, uh, about where logic is already used because, again, to Paul's point, we want to automate, we want to we wanna increase the speed, we want to reuse the logic that we have to the maximum point. So there is a lot of other features and functions in there. Uh, as you can imagine, it's an enterprise-grade application that is targeted uh, for large, large financial organizations right now by, by choice because uh, business logic is, it doesn't wear any color, right? You can do that in manufacturing, you can do that in telecommunication. It's just, it makes sense for us to leverage our relationships that we have in the financial services market. Now, with this, I would like to, to open it up for the floor. I'm, as always, I'm not the technical person, so I tend to talk a lot because I do that as a profession. So, go ahead. <laughs> 